And I want to welcome you to the third in a series of conversations on housing equity in the District of Columbia. Uh, it's, it's fitting that we begin our event today by recognizing and acknowledging the setting for today's dialogue. For today, we gather in the historic neighborhood called Shaw. Is Shaw in the house? Anybody work in Shaw? Anybody live in Shaw? We are gathered in Shaw. And you may know that Shaw is named after Civil War Colonel Robert G. Shaw. And the neighborhood originally began as a freed slave encampment. In the 19th and early 20th centuries, the neighborhood thrived as a center of black culture. This very theater, in fact, the Howard Theater, opened in 1910 and was considered the largest black theater in the world. For decades, the Howard, the Howard Theater served as a space where black artists and performers performed in a segregated city. And so this stage has been graced by the likes of Ella Fitzgerald and Louis Armstrong and Billie Holiday, Cab Calloway, Nat King Cole, Marvin Gaye, Aretha Franklin, The Temptations, Duke Ellington, Diana Ross, and many others whose artistry compelled recognition for people of color in an, as an integral part of our society. Unfortunately, the theater was forced to close in 1968 as a result of racial tension right in this very neighborhood. Ultimately, the Howard Theater was restored and reopened in 2010, thanks to support from the District of Columbia government. And so we gather today during Black History Month to celebrate the history of this great theater and this amazing historic neighborhood called Shaw. While we're at it, it's appropriate that we acknowledge the lands of Native Americans because we need to remind ourselves of history, the history of this country, the history of this neighborhood, and the history of this city that is not unblemished. Indeed, there are scars that we see daily of federal and local discriminatory land use policies. And the truth of the matter is that those scars still have not healed. I did not mention to you that I am the pastor of New Bethel Baptist Church, which is right in Shaw, right around the corner from where we are seated and standing today. My childhood pastor and my predecessor is Walter Fontroy, whose name appears on one of the exhibit boards across the hall. He was one of the architects for housing and redevelopment of Shaw following the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He's the reason why many of the apartment buildings in Shaw are named for pastors and faith leaders and churches who sustained and rebuilt Shaw after race riots had taken place. But now it's our turn. Now it's our turn and I'm proud that even today, New Bethel continues in its mission to expand affordable housing opportunities in this neighborhood and to ensure that those who have lived in Shaw have affordable housing even as the city changes. Interestingly, our efforts through the Foster House Apartments right at the corner of Rhode Island and Ninth there have not been without opposition by the very persons for whom we are seeking to provide housing. I share this because sometimes those scars that I talked about, sometimes they show up in fear that limit vision for those who can benefit from change. And so this is why we're here today, because we have a mayor who is determined to make sure that as our city changes, everyone has the opportunity to benefit from the change. I celebrate and I commend Mayor Muriel Bowser for the vision she and her team have set to make sure that of the 36,000 new housing units to be built by 2025, 12,000 of them will be affordable, fully one third. I think that that merits a little celebration. Here's what I need us to know. 
Mayor Bowser cannot do this work alone. I need somebody to shout together. That wasn't rhetorical. I need somebody to shout together. I'm a black Baptist pastor. I need somebody to shout together. Because it's going to require a level of thinking and engagement that we've not reached before. Because we have the opportunity to remove the shackles of past thinking and enslavement and to embrace opportunities for the future. Because we can build bridges for relationship and create an environment for everyone to grow and to prosper. If we commit to one another, if we commit to community, and if we work together. So let's begin the conversation. It's my great honor to introduce to you one of our city's leaders who shares responsibility to ensure that the goals for affordable housing across all eight wards are met. Won't you help me give a warm Shaw welcome to our Deputy Mayor for Planning and Economic Development, John Fauciccio. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is John Falchicchio, and I'm uh, the Acting Deputy Mayor for Planning and Economic Development here in uh, D.C., and I'm so excited that all of you have joined us to talk about uh, Mayor Bowser's goal of 36,000 new homes by 2025. Uh, just to kind of get a sense of who's in the room, we're going to uh, just do one little two-question survey. It's going to be simple. All I need is uh, folks to raise their hand and keep them up. If you're in the category, just keep it up. Uh, so who's lived in D.C. all their life? Okay, good, good. We've got a good representation. Keep those hands up. Now, who uh, has lived in D.C. for over 20 years? Okay, I'm going to ask my friend on the camera to pan out a little bit so we get the crowd. All right, who's lived in D.C. over 10 years? Everybody should, okay, and keep your hands up if your category is already gone. Keep it up. And who's moved here in the last year? All right, good. So we've got good representation. Keep the hands up, keep the hands up. All right, now, I'm going to close my eyes for this one. Ready? I'm going to ask, who has all the answers on how we create more affordable housing? So keep your hands up. All right, good. So we've got some folks who have all the answers on how we create the affordable housing. At the next session, we may have you guys come on up and join us on stage. But the reason we're here is that uh, I know that I don't have all the answers on how to create the affordable housing. Uh, and that's why we're having uh, this, these sessions, which we like to call continuing the conversation. So the first one that we had was in Deanwood uh, in September. And it was a conversation about why uh, it's important to spread affordable housing and not concentrate it just in one specific neighborhood. So we had a tabletop exercise uh, and folks sat around tables similar to how folks in the back of the room are sitting uh, today. Um, and then we had another conversation uh, in, uh, at, at Wilson High School in Ward 3, and we had a conversation about uh, the uh, Atlas, uh, excuse me, the Opportunity Atlas, which is a guide that shows folks that uh, where, you, uh, where you grow up determines your outcomes. And the reason why we wanted to go through the Opportunity Atlas was to show folks that having affordable housing in high opportunity uh, areas is not a luxury, uh, it's a necessity. And that's why uh, Mayor Bowser put out the housing equity report in October of 2019. And in this report, uh, which I hope you all will take a look at if you haven't already, uh, it lists out where uh, we want to build not just 12,000 units of affordable housing in any one place, but we want to spread it across the 10 planning areas uh, in the District of Columbia. Uh, and really, that means a big concerted push into uh, high opportunity areas that haven't been producing a lot of affordable housing. So that goal of building 36,000 units of, of, of housing uh, in the District of Columbia by 2025, let's kind of put that in perspective. Uh, we're, the mayor announced that goal in 2019, and she said we wanted to achieve it, obviously, by 2025. So about 20, uh, it's about seven calendar years. Uh, the last time we created 36,000 new homes in uh, Washington, D.C., uh, you would have to go from 2018, you'd have to go way back to 2004. 
right? So if you think about it for a moment, what we're trying to do is we're trying to create the same amount of units that we created in 15 years in seven, right? So we're doubling the pace of production uh, in the city. There's also, uh, just so you know, there's about 30, uh, excuse me, 330,000 units of affordable housing. So by creating and adding another 36,000 units of housing, we're adding more than 10% to our housing stock, right? So why is that important? It's important because as people feel the housing affordability crunch, we know that we have to produce more supply. Uh, does anybody want to say where they were in 1995? All right, well, just imagine it for a moment. Where were you in 1995? Okay, so think about that for a moment. And I want you to think about that time because in 1995, uh, do you know how many permits were pulled for uh, housing construction in the District of Columbia? Who said zero? They're not crazy, they're actually right. Zero. So now we're on a pace where we're, uh, we've been producing thousands and thousands of units a year, uh, but our population has risen. And so how do you make uh, sort of a housing uh, pressure, a housing crisis? You have the population increase and you don't increase the units. Today we're here to talk about how we're really gonna make sure that our housing production keeps up with our pace of growth and helps us to address housing affordability. So I wanna thank you guys for being here uh, this morning. We also have, as our, our key element uh, of today's event, uh, undesigned the red line. So hopefully you've had a chance to walk around and see the displays that are around us. We're literally today surrounded by our history, uh, but I'm gonna call April up here now because what April's gonna walk us through is how we're actually surrounded by our history even when we leave this theater uh, today and go to wherever we live in any of the eight wards. So with that, I want to bring up our friends from Undesigned the Red Line, and I want to bring up April to lead us on a conversation. Stay down sure. here. Um, good morning, everyone. I, I want to feel connected and close. I don't want to be just connected on the podium. Um, it's so great to be back in DC. Um, very excited. We initially came with this exhibition a few years back with Enterprise Community Partners, the Mayor's Office, HAN, the Housing Organization of Nonprofit Developers. Um, it, it was a culmination of a lot of interests, and as a designer, um, urban planner, um, architect, I really um, understand how, as we design, whether it's policies that inform then my job of what gets created in the built environment, how it impacts a lived experience. And my background, I grew up in the Bronx at a time when we lost approximately 90% of our housing stock. So I literally, literally grew up in rubble on the front lines of conditions that long have been forgotten um, in this country and, and the worst epidemics. Um, the, the first heroin epidemic um, that was not a public health crisis, but a actual um, criminalized um, activity that people were put into prison. Um, on the heels of the uh, heroin epidemic, the HIV AIDS epidemic of which my father succumbed to. Um, on the heels of the HIV epidemic, the crack epidemic that hit my community. And on the heels of the crack epidemic, um, unprecedented violence. And very young, it was impressed upon me what has led to the conditions that we're talking about today of tremendous inequity within the built environment, whether it be connected to housing, health, education, wages, and labor. And how this intersectionality, as Dr. Crenshaw speaks about, really impacts our health, our well-being, but also it perpetuates this hierarchy of human value within the built environment, who is worthy and who is unworthy of having access to basic human needs. And it really informed my discourse on, particularly in spaces of architecture and design, where women of color are significantly underrepresented. And I found myself in design school and in other policy spaces having conversations with people who are making decisions about our very lives that have no clue about a history that has informed, again, the very conditions that we're dealing with today. And when you sit and you ask, you know, by show of hands here, how many of you have seen or heard about redlining? Raise your hand. And then when you ask people, well, what does that mean for today and what was particular about it, you kind of, you know, did you know why we have redlining maps? the hands come down. Um, and, and it really, again, informed what is the activity, what are the, um, the hubs on the ground that are really grounding and contextualizing how we formulate policy 
to address issues of housing and, and educational disparities that are baked in in a deeper understanding that really speak to the history of what we're dealing with today. So in 2015, I launched a, a design firm called Designing the We, capital W, capital E. It really pivots on this um, notion of democracy, of we the people, and how it's going to take the strong, uh, more cohesive we to really address the issues of what we're dealing with today in the built environment. As what was said earlier, can we do it alone? No. Can um, the mayor do this alone? Absolutely not. Can it just be a couple of CDCs creating um, X amount of units? Absolutely not. There really needs to be an understanding. But I, our argument, along with Richard Rothstein and many others, Dr. Mindy Fullalove, is that we can't bring this togetherness, this we, if we don't have an understanding of how to heal the social fabric, again, of what has happened in this nation. So in understanding crises for us, we really began to delve into why is it, again, that we hear decade after decade, generation after generation, the continuum of how we have lack of accessible housing, how we have these educational disparities, these income disparities, and we really wanted to understand what is the sociological theory how do we think about things? And we came out on a bird's eye view, and we began to look at um, human needs. What we, you know, instead of focusing on race, place, and class, we began to look at what is human needs from Maslow's theory? What is it that we need as human beings to survive? Obviously, shelter is one of them. Um, obviously, communal togetherness is another. And as looking at human needs, we began to look at perception. Um, how we think, how we empathize, how we humanize. And then the correlation between human needs, what we need, the perception of how human needs itself and how we're connecting with each other, how it yields outputs and strategies within the built environment of how we then meet those human needs. And then how the interplay of these three components creates a lived experience. And when we started looking at, well, what is it that when we sit and we look at policies, we look at practices, and we look at investments, there's a deep understanding and encampment of perception. Who is deserving and who is undeserving? Because we are a very rich nation. Poverty is a big business. There is no need for the conditions that we're seeing to exist. And you have to question the integrity and understanding of those who sit at the table. So we start to focus on perception. And we started um, researching, and a lot of the exhibition doesn't just start with the 1930s with the redlining maps under the New Deal. We begin to look at the hierarchy of human value and the subhumanization that has been caked in sociological theory. So what does this mean? How many of you have heard of people like Madison Grant? Raise your hand. Raise your hand high if you've heard of Madison Grant. Madison Grant is the celebrated individual conservationist, um, preservationist, um, was an influencer to presidents like Teddy Roosevelt and many others. Madison Grant wrote a book called The Passing of the Great Race as well. So we celebrate him for all these environmental accomplishments, but the man behind the mask was a man who wrote a book that talked about anti-miscegenation laws, anti-immigration laws in 1915, um, 16, excuse me. And as he's purporting this, this is a thought leader that's really beginning to mold the minds of the, 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 the mentoring others. And Madison Grant's book is so powerful about sub, of subhumanization and eugenics. How many of you have heard of scientific racism and eugenics? This is the ideology he begins to promote. His book is so powerful, Hitler writes him a thank you letter eventually because it's what Hitler bases his, um, his ideology of genocide um, during World War II. Why does this become important is because there's a pivotal moment in this country as we are trying to abolish slavery and enslavement that gives rise to white supremacy, gives rise to an ideology of who is the superior human and who isn't. Therefore, anything that isn't superior is subhuman. And we're going to then respond to that subhumanization through how we treat people within the built environment. If you could look quickly um, in the far uh, left-hand side, um, you, you see the, the, the cartoon of Uncle Sam being eaten by the Irish and the Chinese. So this concept of what we're dealing with, the anti-immigration today, is still encaked in, in how we even treat people who are coming into our country um, today. When we look at sort of what this does and injects within the built environment, 
um, it really creates um, a, a step of how we're going to respond, right? And then we, we, we get to the New Deal. So we see a lot of these redlining maps. We see the policies. You know, what's happening in this country during the New Deal? We're coming off of the heels of the Great Depression in 1929. We're having an economic crisis. Before the New Deal, things like home ownership, you had to put 30 to 50% down on your home, and you only had typically five to seven years to pay that off. But the families now had, didn't have the option of refinancing after the fifth or seventh year because we're in an economic crisis. So something had to be done. It wasn't so much to save the homeowner and, and the hemorrhaging that was happening. We had something very similar in 2008. It was to bail out the banks and the insurance companies because they couldn't afford to have them fail. And as we're creating policies, so we, we launched the Homeowners Loan Corporation that really is charged with going in and refinancing mortgages um, to avoid foreclosure and, and, and the compounding of the, the hemorrhaging that's happening. But as, you know, one million um, homes were refinanced prior to any first redlining map being created, out of the one million homes that were refinanced, 20 to 22,000 were refinanced for people of color. Now, when we look at the practices of racism within the real estate industry and private interests, the very people that were the Madison Grants were also part of a uh, real estate industry. So they're the ones that become stewards of these new policies that under the New Deal. So they come, become part of FDR's administration. And they begin to employ the practices that they were doing in private, the private sector now into the federal government. So we create Homeowners Loan Corporation and the Federal Housing Administration. And then in 1938, we see the first redlining maps. Um, blue, uh, green being optimal for investment, followed by blue, then yellow, then red. Red is deemed hazardous. Red is deemed areas where we're not going to invest in um, and they're, where they're high risk. Race accounted for 20% of the overall weight given to a community. 40% was income. Who was not liked, according to racial lines, in the 1930s? Black and brown people. And who was not earning wages? Black and brown people. So when we look at questions on a survey that ask, what is a detrimental influence for a particular area? Can you all see what that says after that question? It's, it's also in the big, bold, um, it says detrimental influences. What, it makes skin color synonymous with the devaluing of property and area. Because if race wasn't a factor, why are you talking about who's in the environment? Why are you making calls about value and saying that there's an infiltration? At this time, ethnicities like Irish, Italian, Jewish, etc., were also considered undesirables and infiltrators. They did not assimilate into white culture until after World War II. So you had areas that actually had integrated um, uh, amongst people of color, Irish, Italian, because they were all being subjugated to this same subhumanization, hence the, the, the little leprechaun eating Uncle Sam. Um, we, we, we pass these policies and we create this national system that creates the geographical footprint of hypersegregation in America. Because we begin to then create demarcations of value. So what does this mean when we look down um, from the bird's eye view and go into the corridors? So areas that, like what was mentioned earlier, the Shaw District, were once bustling communities um, that had home ownership, that were stabilized, begin to be looked at as places that would never appreciate in value, where nothing was going to happen. So as you're simultaneously disinvesting in these areas and giving them a branding, you're also building the suburbs of America, particularly after World War II. So you have these toddling or this toggle of both ideologies happening at the same time. 
This is a snapshot in the Bronx of a Sanborn map that looks at sort of the architecture and the built environment. A lot of these districts had healthy homes, they had movie theaters, they had accessible healthy food, um, they had, it's a walkable city. We like to think that these are new concepts in the spaces of design, but these were actually very much in existence. And I think, again, it's an indictment to the architecture community that likes to recreate things and coin them, and who coins them becomes a real significant factor uh, of, 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 to me, white supremacy. That's my opinion. Um, and you see this really healthy transit corridor, banks, et cetera. Um, so what begins to happen to these communities is that now we're, we're building the suburbs. So areas that were quasi-segregated, um, but also, as I said, because of those ethnicities still commingling, you had now the, the federal government says, we're going to build infrastructure, we're going to invest, we're going to do all these amazing things um, in the suburbs of America. And this is a um, quote from the underwriting manual. So after we create 239 maps across this country, um, redlining maps that sort of demarcate lines, the federal government says, the FHA, the Federal Housing Administration, says we're going to take it a step further. We're going to negate the need for any type of maps. We're going to actually input in the federal underwriting manual our stipulations on how we're going to back risk. And we're going to mimic that of what was felt and, and the popular view, view of private industry. And I'm going to quickly, I'm going to attempt to quickly read this um, quote. Basically, this is a federal document that has this language. So it basically states, the evaluator should investigate areas surrounding the location to determine whether or not incompatible racial and social groups are present to the end that an intelligent prediction may be made regarding the possibility or probability of the location being invaded by such groups. If a neighborhood is to retain stability, it is necessary that property shall continue to be occupied by the same social and racial classes. A change in social or racial occupancy generally leads to instability and a reduction in values. Sounds a lot like nimbyism today. That if we bring in certain elements into communities, it's going to devalue. If we bring in certain elements into our communities, it's going to devalue. So, I pose this question to you. Has the social, sociological ideology or theory changed very much on how we look at each other? No, no. And what ends up happening to these amazing corridors that were vibrant, like Shaw and, and places where I grew up in the Bronx, um, begin to see something called white flight and the loss of their tax base um, in those communities. Next slide. Um, and this is simultaneously happening as, as opportunities are opening up that, um, in the suburbs. Richard Rothstein speaks of this. People are now able to access FHA loans with little to no money down, especially if you're doing it through the GI Bill, and buying homes that are cheaper to buy than actually rent in the locations they were renting from, from landlords in, in these redlined and yellow um, communities. So what you see is people are migrating up from the south, uh, and people are migrating from the Caribbean. Um, places like Puerto Rico, families like the Benitez family who come from places like Santurce, um, Puerto Rico, where those were the slum conditions that they lived in. Um, and we got to remember, you know, Puerto Rico is a commonwealth of the United States. It's not foreign. People who are from Puerto Rico are actually American citizens. Um, in addition to all of that, they all begin to congregate in places like Harlem. And instead of having these opportunities to access what they think is a better life, whether it's from the Jim Crow South, or the colonialism that was happening in places like Puerto Rico. They're hit with this reality of working hard, low wages, no access to decent housing, blighted conditions, because much is not being invested um, in these areas. And you can see that as we begin to disinvest in these communities, the real estate um, industry sinks its teeth on how we're going to access the space. So could people of color buy in those beautiful suburbs that are being created? No, of course not. We, we read the gut, we read what the, but not only that, a lot of them took it a step further, and there's an example in section two, that in the deeds of the homes of what we were subsidizing, and we as the federal government, tax dollars, it had stipulations that stated this house could not, that restrictive covenants or restrictive deeds. This house could not be sold to anyone who's outside of the Caucasian race. And if you were in violation, there were different things aside from white terrorism and burning of your homes that would create um, um, the, or, or make sure that that didn't happen on a widespread basis. So this becomes so profitable, this system, not just by the real estate agents, 
but the asphalt companies that were building these roadways to the suburbs and, and, and forgetting the pariah city, the automobile industry, the rubber industry, the lumber industry, the, the architecture industry, everyone is eating from this machine. Everybody has their hand in the cookie jar. And as they're eating and stuffing their face with these cookies, they're promoting this in every aspect of the built environment. And this is another quote from a real estate textbook um, that was used by the National Association of Real Estate Boards, which ironically now is the, um, is, is the um, minority arm of the, of the National Real Estate Association, but originally it was not. It was the actual entity. And basically they said the colored people certainly have a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness but they must recognize the economic disturbance which their presence in a white neighborhood causes and forego their desire to split from the established district where the rest of their race lives. Were those desirable districts? Do you think the districts that were assigned to people like my mom were desirable? No, they were not. They were, they were being severely disinvested in. Next slide, please. And so on the heels of um, this disinvestment that starts to begin to happen, we, we, we begin to see, as I mentioned, um, areas that were redlined now on the front lines of those conditions of, of crack, of AIDS, of all, and no money coming in. And then we have the rise of the neoliberal politics in this country, the cutbacks to housing and other social services. So it was a genocide, um, technically, that was happening in many pockets um, throughout this country. And the atonement and the, uh, the accountability has never been there to fully acknowledge this. We see the rise of Reaganomics. Um, I don't have time um, to read Lee Atwater's quote, but Lee Atwater was a senior advisor to Reagan. So think about sociological theory being tied to what they're saying at these tables and using tax cuts as the dog whistle to disinvest and create inequity intentionally. The quote is there if you want to take two minutes or take a picture of it. Um, next slide, please. So now these areas that were once vibrant, this is the same slides that I showed you earlier of this really vibrant corridor in places like the Bronx, are suffering from fires. The house to the left is the house that I grew up in. Um, my mother put her money into that home under a contract buy. A contract buy is not a deed for a home. If you don't know, there's information. And when the house burned, we didn't have the money to, li to leave. We had to stay in that condition in three rooms with no running hot water and a kerosene heater. And that was not in the 40s, 50s. That's in the 80s um, and 90s. And no one cared. And again, it's this picture of understanding we're going through these conditions. I see my mom getting up every single day to work and what's happening within this. And it leads to an enormous amount of unhealed trauma in our community, unresolved issues of what we're trying to face. So these once walkable and vibrant cities are now being left as shells. And the, the, the belief was that the people there didn't matter, that it's somehow their fault and we begin to criminalize to broken windows and stop and frisk and all of these, and we begin to pipeline what's left of our communities into the prison systems. And now today, these once redlined and disinvested areas are experiencing an influx of massive investment. And our argument as, as a company, as a design firm, is that we're in the midst of the second redlining in this country. Because, air, because now the speculation that comes into areas as we buy up property and build and redevelop is certainly not made for the people within those corridors because they have to contend with the reality of wages and labor. And the need is so great. You had a home in one of the hottest drug blocks in the Bronx sell in 2013 for $320,000. In 2016, it was flipped and it was back on the market for $1.2 million. I don't know who in my family and my friends and my area can afford to stay in that community. We know what happened to Harlem. And you, you can all fill in what happened here. The point of highlighting this is not to shame or blame. 
it really is, what are we up against? Do we really understand what it's going to take, the mechanisms, because these are the forces. So the people like my mom and my family who are in the front lines of these conditions, we're, they're displaced from their communities. And where are they going? To the same communities that suffer from the same types of disinvestments, because that's what their wages can allow them to afford. So let that sink in as to what's happening currently in the built environment. It's a replay of how we subsidize. And what's so important about the New Deal is that this wasn't private industry anymore. These are people who took the oath to steward the ideologies and principles of democracy. That we have to take the, the baton and carry forward as a living thing to transform. Who sat at a table and used public money to create the conditions of inequity in the built environment. And we can arguably say that a lot of those conditions and the processes are still very much the same as we look upon. When we see terms like um, low-income housing, what does it conjure up for a lot of people? Public housing, poor people, people of color. Our vernacular may even need to change on how we're describing all of this. So our work is saying that in order to move forward and really create equity within the built environment, we have to understand that we have to reframe, redesign, and reinvest. And it's a transdisciplinary approach. That if you don't understand one through five, please don't sit at the table with me, because we need to have a grounding to start off from. This is a tremendous amount of work. It is not something that's going to happen overnight. And it's going to take not just about how we design buildings, it's going to take how we look at the built environment and look at each other. Next slide, please. Um, when we look at, when we're brought in to do projects across this country, and this exhibit has gone all over, it will be going international um, next year. When we look at how it's not just about a secure home, we know the secure home is connected to well-being, education, creating shared value. It's again these intersectionalities. And how does housing and grounding housing really address the other dynamics of inequity of how we live and what we experience. Next slide. Um, we open these spaces um, in communities called We Labs so that they're a living, breathing archive of what has happened, what continues to happen, and how we unpack how current policy is really addressing equity. Because what does it mean to build a unit of housing in the built environment? How does that unit connect to an ecology and an ecosystem that really is driving equitable change, particularly for those who have historically been disenfranchised in? Next slide. So this is an example of our work in Trenton. It's an East Trenton area. Our stories are no different from across this country. Um, it, it involved a two-acre parcel that was eventually made into an urban farm in an area that had suffered from urban renewal. An entire demographical location was slum cleared under the auspices of having subsidies come in and doing all this grandeur in cities as cities were losing their tax base. Of course, they cleared all those homes and displaced thousands and thousands of families, and those just sat there as empty lots for decades. And that was a consistent story that happened all across um, this country. And as those places sat, they obviously ended up looking disheveled and disinvested in. Next slide, please. Um, so what we did was we, when we went out into the community, when we talked about urban farming, we got a lot of pushback. Um, people, we even got a gentleman saying, are you trying to put us back on the plantation? Um, we weren't involved in the um, project. We, um, we were there to understand why people weren't using it. And when people, um, when we said, well, there's the one framing is an urban farm, but the other framing is how do we use this as an opportunity to redefine land tenure in America? How do we use this two-acre parcel to create, next slide, um, opportunities that have a community land trust component, and not just a localized community land trust, but something that can really compete with real estate investment trusts and leverage um, the power of all of us investing in to take land off of a speculative market. We redesigned and we created the Garden State Agrihood Project that incorporates land conservancy, but also the governance structure of the Garden State Agrihood Project is about how do you take community members to steward a nonprofit to really stop the poverty pimping conversation and, and that's happening in our communities. Um, how do you get people involved 
in the accountability of who's making decisions for them in the built environment. Next slide. We're incubating a cooperative farm that isn't just about growing food. It really is about how it feeds an ecosystem that includes ownership through food trucks, cooperative food trucks, retail businesses, et cetera. So this has become an anchor asset project that we're wait working on. I'm be I, I only have a couple minutes. Next slide. This is just another uh, some of the renderings we did of how to use the space that really drives community and economic development. And this is how we look at it as an ecosystem of shared value, how each project is complementing the other. Um, and when we can think about processes, we really, and, and do outputs like this in the built environment, it, it reinforces as a proof, as I'm walking down the street, that this is how we create equitable human experiences, not on a white paper, it's not buried behind a think tank. People are being forced to cognitively think different. It's a cognitive um, disruption. H how to create positive prog um, perceptions, prog um, progressive systems and structures. Next slide. And all, for us, what it leads to, and what all this work is, is the hard work, is the mental model shift at the very base of this pyramid, right? Because if we can't begin to humanize one another with these types of projects and how we bring people together, we can't build relationships and connections because it'll always be looked at as an us and them. As um, I, uh, I'm here and I get the mortgage interest deduction as a homeowner and you're just the renter undeserving of any type of subsidy. How do we begin to change that narrative? So, and once we build those relationships and connections, we can reinvest in policies, practices, and resource flows with a framework that has been vetted and contextualized with what you're seeing in this room today. Because to do it any other way misses the opportunity. To not talk about the impact, the collateral consequences of such policies. And again, it wasn't just New Deal redlining policies. It was the subsequent policies of neoliberal politics, planned shrinkage, urban renewal, stop and frisk, that have created the conditions. So when we sit at the table, all of us, this capital W, capital E, we come to this table informed, together, as the Reverend said, um, how, we, how we sit here and how we say it is our responsibility to ensure, again, that we the people means we the people. Thank you so much. Thank you, April. Uh, so that was the first time uh, we had April uh, present at uh, one of our Continuing the Conversation uh, uh, events. Just by a show of hands, how many you think we should bring her back? Okay. All right. So thank you, April, and thank you for your team. We're going to keep the displays up, so after uh, the event, you'll have some more time to uh, see the boards and interact uh, with April and her team. Uh, so I just wanted to acknowledge a few folks uh, in the room who help us uh, in this work every day. Uh, we, like the Reverend said, we don't do this alone, we do it together. Uh, so I wanted to acknowledge uh, uh, the mayor's good friend and the at-large uh, member for housing, uh, Council Member Anita Bonds, who's in the room. Uh, and then there's a, a, a few folks from the cabinet, uh, from the mayor's cabinet who are here, but I wanted to highlight uh, some of the folks who are uh, part of what we like to call our housing agency partners. Uh, and so that includes uh, the director of the Department of Housing and Community Development, Polly Donaldson, uh, Tyrone Garrett, the executive director of the Housing, uh, Agent, uh, the housing Authority, uh, Chris Donnell, the uh, interim director of the DC uh, Health, uh, oh, excuse me, Housing Finance Agency, uh, uh, Andrew Trueblood, who's the uh, director of the Office of Planning, uh, and of course, uh, the DEMPED team who helped us put together uh, this event, including uh, Kate, who's been running around uh, all day today. Let's give them a round of applause for their work. And so with that, I wanna keep the program going, and uh, next up, we have a conversation uh, with Mayor Bowser, and we're gonna be led by someone who's been part of each and every one of continuing the conversation, and I hope that continues as well. Uh, our friend and the CEO and Principal of Justice and Sustainability, uh, Association uh, Don Edwards. I'll call him up uh, to the uh, 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 stage and he'll welcome uh, the mayor for us. So let's hear it for Don. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I got to say a few things before I uh, help us, before we bring the mayor out. Number one, look around the room for a minute because this is a good looking room. And the reason why I want you to look around is having grown up in the segregated South, 
I don't take this for granted and neither should you. That's number one. Number two, I don't know how many U.S. mayors, especially of you know, the notable cities of our country, would design a program where you would have uh, segregated by design playing as people milled around looking at an exhibit called Undesigned the Red Line, and then come out and actually talk about this wildly ambitious goal of putting 36,000 housing units, 12,000 of which will be affordable, in place in another five or seven years. I don't know whether you think I'm crazy, but I think, you know, even if you have all the answers to what we should do, you got to give credit for the fact that this is not a program you're going to see in a lot of other cities, especially not the capital city of the United States in the year 2020. That's just my opinion. I don't know. Anybody here agree with me about that? So since we have someone who is that kind of a mayor, please help me and join me in welcoming the Honorable Muriel Bowser, the mayor of the District of Columbia. Thank you. All right, so uh, we don't have a lot of time and we want to really dig into it. Uh, mayor Bowser, you have been talking about this ambitious thing and I just said it's five to seven years. Tell people who may or may not know about it in detail what it is you're trying to accomplish and why, because it's, it's kind of like mind-blowing for a lot of people. Sure. So, so thank you, first of all, Don, for doing this with us and for being with us for a lot of planning discussions. I was thinking back this morning to when I might have met you for the first time, and it was either around the zoning rewrite or Walter Reed or some um, community issue that was really important uh, for us to deal with, and you do it, uh, you do it so well. So thank, thank you. you for being with us. Uh, and this discussion about affordable housing is not a new one uh, for, for our team, for our administration. Uh, we knew early on going into this that housing was the big issue for Washington, D.C. Uh, at the time, it was back and forth between education or housing or public safety, what was top of mind for D.C. residents. Um, but I had seen in eight years as a council member the growing demand, the growing pressure, um, and the changing um, nature of neighborhoods. And I felt um, the anxiety, I felt the tension, uh, and I also felt that we didn't have all the tools that we needed. Uh, so I started uh, our administration with a commitment to $100 million at least uh, for the Housing Production Trust Fund. And at the time, uh, we were spending about 50 million out of our housing production trust fund. So I committed to make up the difference for whatever the, the trust fund produced uh, to make 100 million. And we've done that for five straight years. Uh, and what that has allowed us to do uh, is to let the development community know, let our government agencies know that we have to operate at this level each and every year, at least uh, to produce uh, units across the city. Uh, and, and while we were doing a lot, it still felt like a drop in the bucket because people still want to be in this town. Uh, so we're attracting people, we're keeping people, and the pressure on housing prices um, just continues to grow. So this year, uh, or la the beginning of last year, uh, when uh, the voters gave me another four years uh, to do this, uh, we wanted to be more specific about what we needed to get done. The COG had started a discussion, largely at our urging um, from the district, to have a region-wide discussion of what was needed. And over, we found there's a regional gap of over 300,000 units by, I think, 2030. Our share of that is 36,000 units. So we said, we're going to set this 36,000 um, unit goal, uh, and we're going to break down that goal um, all across the city, all eight wards, all 10 planning areas. We're going to be realistic about what it will take to get there. And we're going to lead the discussion. Uh, we're going to lead it in the communities. We're going to lead it at the council. Uh, we're going to lead it with developers. We're going to need it with our finance partners out there. Uh, and that is the only way that we have any shot um, at getting that number of units built across the city. 
So why is it, why is it that, that, that uh, you are looking at this through the lens of holding on uh, to the folks who are here or prioritizing? You know, people have raised the question of, is this just another ploy or play for displacement and gentrification? And I think one of the things that uh, it would be helpful for you to talk about is how you actually see the connection between your goals and what April, for instance, talked about today. You're, you're a local, you're a homegirl here. Mm -hmm. So you can talk about what it has meant for you to grow up in the district and how that created your opportunity space, how it's lended itself to your expectations of the city you want to live in, you want to live in. Uh, absolutely, and so I, I frequently tell the young people that I talk to um, that we wouldn't be doing any of this. It wouldn't be worth any of the work that we do down at City Hall to build a great city if they couldn't live in it, uh, if they couldn't afford to live in it. That's how I feel. My family has been here for five generations, and there'll be generations after me. Uh, and I want to make sure that this is a city, number one, that I can recognize, um, that I can afford, and that my daughter can afford. Uh, and we have to be intentional about those policies. And uh, the change in our city has been very fast. Mm. Uh, I remember telling someone the story. Uh, my aunt lived uh, a Georgia and Irving for mm. most of her life. Uh, and one time I was, you know, some years later, I think I was on the council by this time, a lot had changed in Columbia Heights and in, in, in the area where, where she lived now, I think it's actually called Pleasant Plains. But I was coming up 14th Street with the intention of going to her house. And uh, I looked up and I said, hold it, I'm in, I'm in Ward 4, I passed Irving Street. <laughs> And I realized that I didn't recognize the intersection that I had turned on a thousand times in my life. Uh, and so that was just, it was kind of a wake up call to me that for, now I didn't live in Ward 1, I grew up in Ward 5, but I, it was just kind of a wake up call to me of how really physically different um, things had been in my lifetime. Uh, and so that, is just for, for a lot of people, they won't have that experience because they have only experienced 14th and Irving um, the way it is today. Uh, so we are, in everything that, that we're doing and talking about building new units um, and talking about building them in all eight wards of the city, it is a complicated conversation uh, because for many people, there is, there is a lot of, um, People like the way things are in many ways. They don't want to see their neighborhoods change. They like the old building here. Um, they like the aesthetic, perhaps. Um, but we all know, uh, because we can look at the polls, we can go to community meetings all across the city, and no matter your income level, people of all income levels are anxious about housing. Yes. So the person with no money um, and in not a good paying job is worried about paying the rent. The senior who has had stable housing her whole life and now has limited or a fixed income is worried about being able to stay. The young college educated person who wants to live here, who grew up in a nice home and their parents um, provided for them, now face the prospect of not being able to have the same type of lifestyle that they had growing up. So people of all incomes are feeling that anxiety. You're not gonna be the mayor in 2025. <laughs> yeah, so, so let, me just, let me just raise the question how do you intend to get this target met and why should people understand that this is not Mayor Bowser's target? Thank you, Don. Yeah, I yeah. tell them that all the because time. Because you're not going to be the mayor. Well, I could be the mayor. It's not <laughs> likely that I'll be the mayor. Um, you know, <laughs> so... You know that. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, 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 um, yeah, yeah. But yeah, that's, yeah. that's another conversation. Yeah. Um, but how, how, do I, how do I do it? That's yeah. a good question. Yeah. Um, because, and I think it's really up to everybody uh, here. 
uh, to make sure that this remains a city priority. Now we can, uh, I think it would be hard for any mayor to roll back a commitment to at least $100 million in the Housing Production Trust Fund. Um, but quite frankly, I think we could use more. I think that we are now seeing that our bureaucracy, our agencies, we're seeing that the private sector partners out there can handle getting more money out the door and producing more more units, uh, and that's important. Uh, we've codified in some ways on the executive side uh, this goal of 36,000 uh, new units, and we're using all of our tools that are um, longer lasting, like our comprehensive plan, to also codify this expectation. Uh, but it is true uh, that we, it will depend on all of us to carry these goals on, so that 36,000 uh, unit goal uh, doesn't switch to something else. I heard someone say uh, that we've done enough with housing, now we need to switch our attention to, to public education. And the, the truth is, in a city like ours, we have to do both. Mm -hmm. We have to be very urgent about housing and very urgent about public education. And one shouldn't steal from the other. You're getting pushed back. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> You're getting pushed back from across the city as you talk to people about this, though. You heard April say, one of the questions you've got to ask is, what do we need to understand? And doing, it, doing this program on the back or on the basis of this kind of a exhibit raises up the question, you have been saying that it's not about NIMBYism entirely. It's about having a conversation that's sensitive and recognizing that these anxieties and fears that you mentioned, that everybody across the city, no matter what the income, color, they have anxiety. They do. And, and what does that mean for you to, I mean, I've been in three of these conversations now. Where, where are we going with this? What do, you, what do you want to see happen? Well, I think uh, my job, Don, is to make sure that we're putting in front of communities um, concrete viable options and explaining to them um, that we, we need change in a lot of ways. We need discussions in the communities. As I mentioned, we may need legislative or zoning changes. We definitely need funding. We need private sector help. And so my job and the way I see this is that we are trying to convene conversations that make it possible uh, for all of these things to happen. We look back to our experience with building short-term family mm -hmm. housing all across the city as a guide. Um, our idea is, was that we had a big citywide problem, a crisis really. Our uh, shelter for families uh, was, was failing. We lost a child there, right? We still don't know where Relisha is. Yeah. And so we, people across all eight wards, said that's not the type of facility or that represents our values for protecting vulnerable children. So we had a big goal. Um, and people all over the city embraced that goal and, and how to get there. Uh, so we and I did not want to see another big shelter built, but we wanted smaller, dignified, humane shelters where families could get on their feet and uh, we wanted every part of the city to do it. Now, I was a ward council member, an ANC commissioner, uh, so I know what it means to say to a community, I'm gonna build a shelter. Mm -hmm. It's hard, and so, but it's much easier if I say, this is our big problem, and every part of the city is gonna be a part of the solution. You won't be overburdened, I'm not asking you to do twice as much, I'm just gonna say we're all gonna be a part of the solution. It was hard, very difficult discussion. Um, but one thing that we learned um, is if we can say that we're gonna have wonderful facilities, they're gonna look nice, they're gonna be built nicely, they're gonna be sustainable, we're gonna have local involvement, we're gonna have effective service providers in those buildings, um, and this, we're gonna have an agreement with the community about how the government and the facility are gonna to operate together, um, that we could kind of anticipate some of the com community concerns and address them. There's no reason why a short-term family housing facility or an affordable housing, a new residential affordable housing or preserved affordable housing has to be any different yep. uh, than the housing 
that's in the community already. Um, so it is important for us to think about how we do that. Um, and I asked a, a group of people the other day, I was asked, what, what do you see as um, the other challenges out there? Uh, because if we're going to spend $100 million, $200 million, or wherever we get uh, in, in our budgets uh, for affordable housing and the Housing Production Trust Fund and public housing, we, have to, we don't have all the tools we need yet in construction and sustainability. Why is it so expensive? Mm. We know the land values, and we're not going to be able to do a lot about land values in the district. But we have to be thinking and pushing industry to be more innovative about how we're constructing housing. So, you know, I know that there are a lot of people who are new folks. When John did the um, little survey, but there are a lot of people whose hands I saw, and I'm one of them who've been here for decades. One of the things that people say is that gentrification, displacement, that, that all development is bad. And I gotta ask, you know, in, do we really think that? Or is that, is that the framing that we wanna have because it seems to me that this building that we're in and the neighborhood that we're in are examples of, you know, did we want this building to stay closed and empty? Uh, did we want the growth around the corner and just this block to not have occurred? So I'm, I'm wondering, you know, in your view, how can we begin to help folks understand that it's the conversation about development that you really are trying to encourage? It's, it's recognizing that there are choices, first of all, that we can make, and there are influences we can make. I remember that um, one of the things that Mayor Williams talked about was if he had known how successful this idea of attracting 100,000 people to the district would have been, that maybe they would have created some other uh, underpinnings yep. for, for what that was gonna do on the downside. So how do we begin to really look at development in a more comprehensive and, and a way that ref respects the complexity of the thing we're trying to do? Right, and so not only would this building probably not have been here, a lot of people in this room wouldn't have been here Amen. if we hadn't made the types of investments um, that we've made, um, but other people would have been here. Mm. Um, so that is, that's the, the, the real conundrum, right? So we attracted people. Some people couldn't afford to stay. Some people decided to leave for, for other options around the region. Uh, but there has been the place, displacement of black people out of the city. That's just the bottom line. And we have to confront the decisions that the government made um, that encouraged that and deal with them head on. Um, now, some of them our local government made, uh, many more the federal government has made for much longer. Yeah. Um, so that, that's part of the discussion um, that, that we are having today. Uh, and I think Mayor Williams was probably right. I, people thought he was crazy yeah. to say that 100,000 people would come to Washington. Uh, after all, we were on the heels of being the murder capital of the, the, the country. Um, our schools were failing, our infrastructure was failing, and our people, black and white, were fleeing. Yeah. Okay, so that was a, a very bold statement that nobody believed would ever happen. Uh, well, since then, uh, we have made historic investments in our schools that have turned them around entirely. We're a safer city. We have invested in our recreation centers and libraries and our transportation infrastructure. That's why we're one of the hottest cities in the, in the region uh, anywhere in the United States of America. Um, and you don't want to be a city um, that is not attracting people or businesses or has crime that's, that's uncontrolled. So you, you, none of us want or are longing for those days. Uh, but we do want to be more intentional about when we developed what is happening um, with the local businesses, what is happening with the local people, uh, and how can we use our local policies to change that? And how can we lobby for federal action uh, to change that? Okay, well, good luck with the federal part for right now. Um, maybe we can do something now. Um, we can do something. It in in a few months, in a we few months. That's right. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And everybody here is registered, right? Absolutely. Okay. Um, 
You mentioned that this is not simply a DC problem though. This is regional and I'm just curious because if we're going to make this happen, we have to do it in context. How, how are your regional partnerships emerging around this with your leadership in the district? Well, I think uh, quite frankly, and I've said this before, that the region needs to do more. Um, and we pushed very hard um, at COG to have the region set a goal. Uh, and for each of the jurisdictional members to set a goal. And this huge, huge pushback um, against that. Um, and I don't even know where every one of the jurisdictions has landed at this point. Um, but we believe if we don't have a goal, there's no way we're going to make the units. And I believe the same is true for them. Uh, they also need to come up with the tools. Now, one advantage for us is that we are a city county state. So there is no going to Richmond for us. We, we go to the city council. Um, but they have to deal with uh, going to the state in some cases and having a real commitment uh, to housing affordability. They cannot offload it to the private sector. Even if they did at least what we're doing, um, it, would, it would mean a lot. You know, I know that um, there's some comment cards that have been passed around, and I want to make sure that there's some time, or if you got a few for me now, Kate, that's great, because I want to use the opportunity to bring up um, some of the questions from the floor. But before I do that, I want to just ask one more question. And that is, you know, after people leave here today, I mean, if, if there is, uh, you're making a serious case, and the thing I like about it, I'll be perfectly honest, is there's real risk involved here. Yeah. You, you set a target, well, you can miss the target, yep. you can fail. Yep. And um, let's face it, you know, it's a certain kind of leadership that, that takes on that kind of risk. So I think you can say whatever you want about it, but it's risky. Uh, to have done it. Mm -hmm. So um, you're serious about this, I take it. Oh, I'm dead serious. Dead serious. Okay. All right. Well, okay. You heard it. Uh, what are you doing as mayor to make sure that all of D.C. thrives and not just those living west of the river? And I guess I'd like to add to that question. Uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, this idea is a five to seven year idea. What are we gonna do while that is being built, while that affordable housing is coming into the pipeline and out of it? So it's like, what about right now? Oh, the right now is kind of the, the five year strategy that we've been on since, um, since I was first sworn in in 2015. Uh, and that is to have more housing resources available uh, and not only deal with the supply side of creating more, uh, but how are we helping people in the district afford more, um, which is also a big part of the equation. So I guess in 2015, we set out to raise the minimum wage in Washington, D.C., and by July 1, we'll be at $15 an hour. Uh, we also created an infrastructure academy, one of the, the, the sectors with the most unmet, um, that has openings and not enough DC residents in those uh, positions that are good paying jobs is in infrastructure. We're creating a lot of infrastructure uh, demand in the city. Metro is going to spend a billion dollars a year rebuilding the Metro. Um, Pepco, Washington Gas, DC Water, billions of dollars of construction uh, in our city and in our region. And we want DC residents uh, in those jobs. And so we have also completely um, revamped our TANF program, um, our homeless services program, all in an effort to make sure more DC residents on our, are on a pathway uh, to a good paying job, which is part of the equation when you're talking about housing affordability. What about these folks who are living uh, in the rest of the city, not west of the river? Same, especially. When I talk about um, those programs, they predominantly uh, impact people who are living in Ward 7 and 8. I'm struggling with affording my home. What resources are there for me to use? 
Um, at, it would depend on the, the questioners, uh, a lot about the questioner circumstances, but I get questions like that a lot from senior residents mm -hmm. uh, who, who have homes, whose property taxes can continue to rise because the values in their neighborhoods are going up. Uh, they may have a lot of uh, equity, but they are, don't, uh, for any number of reasons, haven't made the types of repairs that they need to make to be safe uh, at home. Uh, so we created a program called Safe at Home for DC Seniors. Um, it's income restricted. We like to see the income restriction go up a little bit. That allows them to make um, with, a, with a grant, a free grant, uh, to make the types of adjustments to their homes that will allow them uh, to age in place in their homes. We've done some things around senior um, property taxes. I heard that Council Member Bonds was here. Uh, Council Member Bonds uh, also has for a number of years championed legislation uh, that would uh, either, um, what's the word, defer or eliminate property taxes for senior homeowners, which I wholeheartedly support. We need to build some more support for it at the council. Um, and I think that is a benefit. Now, there is a group of seniors that I am especially concerned about, and that's senior renters with very limited incomes. Um, and there is still work to do. Now, part of, uh, I think, the at my strategy on the national level is to push through the League of Cities, to push the 2020 candidates, to talk about something um, that we talked about with Mike Bloomberg last week, and that's a guaranteed rental assistance for people who are 30% and below of the area family income. And if we can get that commitment from the federal government, it will be a game changer in our city. So um, I know you have many things to do today, and I think we've all very much appreciated. I mean, just the fact that everybody has stayed here and hopefully listened closely. This has been a series, though. We talked about the series that started back in uh, Dean Wood, and I was there, and then we were at Wilson High School, and I was there, and now we're here. What's, what's next? Where are we going? Well, my team is going to tell me where I'm going next on our, our next series because these have been three very robust discussions. Um, I hear the feedback and um, I always, it was, I was at a, um, set many, many years ago, uh, the Humanities DC did a series of discussions about gentrification in communities, in community spaces. The government um, wasn't involved at all, but I thought it was some of the most authentic discussion I heard among neighbors about a changing city. And uh, I think that is what we need. We can start it, but I don't, I don't think that the government is the one that's really going to have those conversations bear fruit. Uh, so we would love to see those types of conversations uh, in communities because it, it just reminded me, because I saw, I was a council member in Ward 4, as the development in Petworth started mm. to happen. Um, and I said, if, if Petworth gets this right, where it's, it's the type of development that the community de demanded, they advocated for it, was the development that they wanted. But what I saw is if neighbors can get along, people living side by side, going to block parties, dealing um, with problems as they arrive, then we'll be a stronger city for it. Um, and we have to like recognize each other and see each other. The newcomer has to see um, the resident who's been there for generations, their value, their struggle, their aspirations. The person who's been there for decades has to see the newcomer as having value and being able to be a part of the conversation and a part of the district's future. Uh, but being able to have that candid, authentic discussion sometimes is missed over listservs where people are screaming at each other or meetings where people are screaming at me or, you know, so that's like we all live here. If we want to stay here together, we have to be a part of the solution. All right, we're going to end it right there. Thank you Thank so you. much, Thank you. Mayor Bob. Thank you. I know the people are going to want to spend a little time Absolutely. with you. Absolutely. I'll come uh, down. So thank you all for coming out. I know John is going to close us out. Thank I'll you. walk thank out you. with you. Good to okay. see you. you too. Thank you. Let's thank Don and Mayor Bowser. Thank you for that.
conversation. Just uh, as Don asked, what is next? So next uh, is really an exercise that we're going to go into about uh, the budget. The mayor presents her budget on uh, March 19th, uh, but before that, we'll actually have a series of engagements around uh, the budget. We call them our budget engagement forums. We hope that you'll come to those events. Uh, they're all listed on mayor.dc.gov, and uh, they start actually with a senior uh, budget engagement forum on Monday, uh, and then the following week, we'll actually have them uh, uh, three events on a Tuesday, Thursday evening, and a Saturday morning uh, where folks can come and give their uh, input on what their budget priorities are. And we do that in order to inform the budget that the mayor will present on March 19th. So thank you all for being here. There are agencies who are our housing agency partners around the room at the back. Uh, if you want to interact with them, have questions. Uh, but thank you all for coming and give yourselves a round of applause for being here this morning.